Juan Diego oh, yeah. and just that it's lo- it's just like love like a powerful love and then that that faith that faith in in Christ our Lord and Savior I mean and I'm I'm learning I'm always learning I'm trying to grow like okay I, like I have to you know I'm I'm still learning myself this minute this second um to be more humble and you know I'm always looking to learn Scott I mean well, I, I am too, but I tell you, Our Lady has become my primary professor, my mentor. Um, you know, I'm a scholar, I'm a professor, I'm a doctor, and all of that, but I remember what Mother Angelica said to me shortly after I got my PhD. You know, I was sitting with her, we were oh. getting ready to have an hour together, and I made sure that my name was on the screen with a PhD, and right. she rolled her eyes. I'm like, what's wrong? She <laughs> said, at the end, it doesn't matter how many letters you have after your name. The only thing that matters is whether you end up with two letters in front of your name. <laughs> S-T. We're here to become saints. And I'm like, man, that is wisdom. Give that woman an honorary doctorate. You know? wow, wow. And I, I do. I ask Our Lady, please teach me not only the Bible, because I, she conceived the word incarnate in her womb. You know, but she conceived him in her heart before he came to her womb, as St. Augustine said. Right. And so I, I've asked her, you know, teach me to read the Bible, teach me to theologize, but I mean, also give me your heart right. so that what I learn, I will live and share with that humble joy that comes from you, our mother. Wow. Amen. And um, I mean, having both is is like having that that love that humbleness and then that that um phd and everything you have that's like a double that's like a double win so keep it <laughs> keep it up scott but the so. first one is a much bigger win than the second <laughs> right right uh, yeah phd we joke about what it stands for it stands for piled high and deep <laughs> you, you learn more and more about less and less until you no, nothing at all. <laughs> right, right. And you learn because you love the Lord. So I know why. Increase my love for right, the Lord. Right, Yes. That's why you love to study it because it just, you you have that great love for, for Christ. So thank you so much for sharing that wisdom with, with the world, Scott. Thank you so much for that. Um, what would you say was the number one key to you becoming Catholic? Well, as I said, it was our Lord Jesus, right. as I found him in Scripture, and then the Eucharist. You know, and I, I just want to propose that, you know, this might be a good point also to transition because it was studying the Eucharist and finding it in the Mass, then suddenly I realized, you know, a lot of things that I believed were true, but I didn't understand them properly. You know, as a Protestant or a Catholic, we all recognize that when Jesus died on Calvary, that was a sacrifice. Right. But then I discovered that nobody standing there at Calvary on Good Friday would have possibly witnessed a sacrifice because they were devout Jews. They would know that for a sacrifice to take place, it has to be in the Jerusalem temple on the top of an altar with a Levitical priest standing by to minister the sacrifice. Jesus was crucified outside the walls of the city, far from the temple, where there were no altars. It was a Roman execution. So how does a Roman execution in the first century become a holy sacrifice for all believers in the 21st century, whether we're Catholic or Protestant? And the only way the early church came to understand Good Friday, not simply as an execution, but as a sacrifice, was by looking at it in the light of Holy Thursday the Eucharist, right. in the upper room that Jesus instituted while celebrating the Passover of the Old Covenant. He was the Lamb of God, so he came to fulfill the Old Passover and establish the New, and the Passover was never just a meal. And so the Eucharist isn't either. If the Eucharist is just a meal, then Calvary is just an execution. Wow. But if the Eucharist is the Passover of the New Covenant, it had to be a sacrifice because that's what always the past was. And so if the Eucharist is where the sacrifice begins, 
then Calvary is where that sacrifice is consummated, then he's not the victim of Roman violence on Friday. He's the victim of divine love on Holy Thursday. He wasn't losing his life at the cross if he was giving his life in the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist is what transforms the execution into a sacrifice, but the resurrection on Easter Sunday is what transformed that sacrifice into the Blessed Sacrament, because the Eucharist is the same body of Christ as the disciples witnessed in the upper room on Holy Thursday, the same body that was hanging on the cross on Good Friday, the same body that was buried in the tomb on Holy Saturday, but the real presence of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, is more specifically and concretely the resurrected body of Jesus. And this is why on Easter Sunday, he didn't disclose his identity for hours to Clopas and his friend as they walked mile after mile until they got to Emmaus and he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them. In Luke 24, just as he had done with the 12 disciples in Luke 22, and so in breaking the bread, in celebrating the Eucharist, suddenly their eyes are opened to the risen Savior. Right. And so what I would want to point out to people is that the Eucharist is not only what turned Calvary from an execution to a sacrifice, but the Eucharist is the sacrament of Jesus' resurrection for him right. back then, but for us now. This is how he plans to fulfill that promise. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise him up on the last day. Because when we receive Holy Communion, we're receiving the resurrected body of Christ. When we right. eat ordinary food, we assimilate it to our body like a hamburger or a milkshake or fries or whatever else. But when we receive Holy Communion, we don't really assimilate Christ's resurrected body to our mortal body. He assimilates our mortal body to his resurrected body and sets into motion something that will not be complete when we leave after the end of Mass, won't be complete until we leave this mortal life on earth and enter into his immortal glory. And that's really why I can look back and see how it was discovering Christ in the Eucharist. And I can trace that a straight line to why I worked on this book called Hope to Die, the mm -hmm. Christian meaning of death and the resurrection of the body, because the Eucharist is the key that showed me Wow, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it wasn't the same as Lazarus. He simply got his mortal body back. But right. when Jesus was raised from the dead, it's a historical event, but it's not just the resuscitation of a corpse. It's the fulfillment of a prophecy. He was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. But it's more than just having his innocence vindicated. It's more than just having the prophecy fulfilled. It is the transformation of the humanity that he took from us in order to give us his divinity. So oh. in the Eucharist, it's his body, it's his blood, it's his soul, that's human, but it's also his divinity. He oh. has taken what is ours to give us what is his, to make us partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. I mean, when I believed the gospel as a teenager, I knew I was forgiven. But I didn't realize I was adopted, brought into a family that is divine, and fed a meal that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's like the good news just got almost too good to be true unless this is the truth and nothing but the truth. And God is helping us as right. Catholics to make us not just forgiven, to, but, but to make us holy, to make us saints, wow. not just transubstantiating bread and wine into Christ but transforming sinners like me into saints. It's like, okay, God, two thumbs up. Keep fathering us, prodigal sons and daughters. Get us home. Amen. Wow. Amen to that. So the Eucharist, uh, that truth yes. in, in the gospel. And and um, you mentioned the, the early church fathers. For anyone listening who, who don't know anything, like they've never heard of the early church fathers, in a simple way, can you explain who the early church fathers are just in, a, in you know, layman's terms or just for anyone that that who have never heard many Christians out there who've never heard of them? 
Sure. Well, we know the importance of the 12 apostles. You know, in the book of Revelation, you can see how the 12 apostles aren't dead. They're up in heaven and they form living stones, the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. So they're the, the ones that Jesus chose to found the family of God, the, the Catholic Church. But you also have, well, I mean, every country, America, Mexico, they have founding fathers. But the Catholic Church also has these early church fathers, and they really are functioning like spiritual fathers. So in the first century, it's Jesus and the Twelve. But in the second century, you see St. Irenaeus, who was directly linked to John, the beloved disciple. You also have St. Justin Martyr, who describes around the year 130 AD what worship looked like in the first and second generations of believers. And what I discovered, it is a perfect match for the Mass. Not wow. the service that I led as an evangelical pastor, but what that Catholic priest did the first time I went to Mass. And so the early church fathers show us how the early church learned from Jesus and the apostles to celebrate the Eucharist as the main event.